All right, everybody, this is chapters four and five tonight. Uh, we've got Gracie back with us again. And we are reading Charlie in a Great Glass Elevator. And we are on chapters four and chapters five. So far, we left off to where they're reaching the space hotel, okay? Chapter four is titled The President, okay? One second. Nice work. One, two, one, two. <laughs> All right, I'm The President. Squished. He squished? All right. Half a mile back, Shuckworth, Shanks, and Schaller were keeping the television cameras aimed all the time at the glass elevator. And across the world, millions and millions of people were clustered around their TV screens, watching tensely and drama being acted out 240 miles above the earth. In his study in the White House sat Lancelot R. Gillygrass, President of the United States of America, the most powerful man on earth. In this moment of crisis, all his most important advisors had been summoned urgently to his presence, and they were all were now following closely on the giant television screen. Every everyone moved, every move made by this dangerous-looking glass capsule, and its eight desperate-looking astronauts. The entire cabinet was present. The chief of the army was there together with four other generals. <clears throat> there was a chief of the Navy and chief of the Air Force and a sword swallower from Afghanistan who was the president's best friend. There was the president, chief financial advisor, who was standing in the middle of the room trying to balance the budget on top of his head, but it kept falling off. Standing nearest of all to the president was the vice president, a huge lady of 89 with a whiskey chin. She had been the president's nurse when he was a baby and her name was Miss Tibbs. Miss Tibbs was the power behind the throne. She stood no nonsense from anyone. Some people said she was a strict with the president now and when, when he was a little boy. She was the terror of the White House and even the head of the FBI broke into a sweat when summoned to her presence. Only the president was allowed to call her nanny. The president's famous cat, Mrs. <laughs> Tapsypuss, was one in the room, was also in the room. Tabsy puss, I guess that's the name. There was absolute silence now in the presidential study. All eyes were riveted on the TV screen as a small glass object with the booster rockets firing slid smoothly up behind the giant space hotel. They're going to link up, shouted the president. They're going on board our space hotel. They're going to blow it up, cried the chief of the army. Let's blow them up first. Crash, bang, wallop, bang, 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 bang. The chief of the army was wearing so many metal ribbons, they covered the entire front of his tunic on both sides and spread down onto his pants. As well, come on, Mr. P, he said. Let's have some really super duper explosions. Silence, you silly boy, said Miss Tibbs, and the chief of the army slunk into a corner. Listen, said the president. The point is this. Who are they, and where do they come from? Where's my chief spy? Here, sir, Mr. President, sir, said the chief spy. He had a false mustache, a false beard, false eyelashes, false teeth, and a falsetto voice. Knock, knock, said the president. Who's there, said chief spy. Courtney. Courtney who? Courtney one yet, said the president. There was a brief silence. The president asked you a question, said Miss Tibbs in an icy voice. Have you Courtney one yet? No, ma'am, not yet, said the chief spy, beginning to twitch. Well, here's your balance, snarled Miss Tibbs. Quite right, said Mr. President. Tell me immediately who those people are in the glass capsule. Aha, said the chief spy, twirling his false mustache. That is the very difficult question. You mean you don't know? I mean, I do know, Mr. President. At least I think I know. Listen, we have just launched the finest hotel in the world, right? Right. And who is so madly jealous of this wonderful hotel of ours that wants to blow it up? Miss Tibbs said the president. Wrongs, Miss Tibbs said the president. Wrong, said the chief spy. Try again. Well, said the president, thinking deeply, in that case, could it not perhaps be some other hotel owner who is envious of our lovely hotel? Brilliant, cried the chief spy. Go on, sir. You're getting warm. It's Mr. Waldorf, said the president. Or Miss Astoria. Warmer and warmer, Mr. President. Mr. Ritz? You're hot, sir. You're boiling hot. Go on. I've got it, cried the President. It's Mr. Hilton. 
Well done, sir, said the chief spy. Are you sure it's him? Not sure, but certainly warm, possibly, Mr. President. After all, Mr. Hilton's got hotels in just about every corner in the world, but he hasn't got one in space. And we have. He must be madder than a maggot. By gum, we'll soon fix this, snapped the president, grabbing one of the 11 telephones on his desk. Hello, he said into a phone. Hello, hello, hello. Where is the operator? He jiggled fiercely at the little thing you jiggle when you want an operator. Operator, where are you? They won't answer you now, said Mr. Tibbs. They're all watching the television. Well, this one will answer, said the president, snatching up a bright red telephone.